Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Come on, folks, wherever you are, I'm sure you can say it with more feeling than that. So let's try it again. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord, the Lord is, is risen, risen indeed. Hallelujah. And indeed he is. It might not feel quite like it this year, or at least it doesn't feel like it normally does on Easter Sunday, given that we are not gathered together in church and we are still living under the constraints imposed by COVID-19. Nevertheless, Jesus Christ is risen. Alleluia. When I think of the resurrection and what it means, or at least part of what it means, because it means more than we're going to be able to cover in any one homily, but one thing that I, I do think of is this. I'm reminded of something that happened when I was a child. When I was a, a youngster, we would gather for family gatherings like one does, or at least one does when not living in self-isolation. And we would, we would have family gatherings at Christmas or Thanksgiving or for whatever reason, and often we would go to my aunt and uncles, my aunt Barb and my uncle Lavon's, and we would eat and laugh and play games and all the things one does. And then sometimes... If we were there on a Sunday evening and, and it came to the time when Lassie was on TV, we would sit around the living room and watch an episode of Lassie. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Lassie, Lassie is a classic television show uh, that was on in the 50s and 60s. And Lassie was a dog, a collie, who lived with a farm family with a, a little boy named Timmy. And every week on Lassie, there would be some problem, some serious situation that uh, looked very desperate. And one way or another, Lassie, because Lassie was a particularly intelligent dog, Lassie would find a way to either go and find help or herself figure out how to solve the problem. And I'd, I'd, I actually can't remember much of any particular episode, but here would be a, 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 an example scenario. Timmy and Lassie would be out walking around having fun, and then maybe they would fall uh, through uh, an, into an abandoned uh, mine. And then before they could get out, there would be some shake, and, and, and part of the mine would collapse and close off the way to get out, and things would go dark. And then there would be a commercial break. And you would not know if Timmy and Lassie were trapped or if they got smothered by the falling rocks. But there was a commercial break. And at that point, my uncle Levon, like a lot of uncles might do, would turn to us little people and say, I don't know, y'all. Uh, this is a pretty bad situation. I don't know how Lassie and Timmy are going to get out of this one. In fact, I think this is probably the last episode of Lassie because I'm not sure they're even going to survive. And little kids that we were, we would start to get really upset and distressed. Oh no, Lassie, Timmy. And then the commercial would end and we would come back and one way or another, Lassie would figure out another way to get out of the mine and she and Timmy would get out and everybody would be okay, and at the end, everybody was happy, and the, the, the episode would end, and there'd be the credits with somebody whistling green sleeves. My uncle would continue to try that trick for some time, but after a while, we caught on, and we knew that however desperate the situation was, however bad it looked for Lassie or whoever else in the show, that the commercial would, there would be a break for the commercial, and my uncle would say, I don't know, it looks like Lassie's done for this time. But we caught on to him and we started to know that after the commercial break, Lassie would find her way out, and so we were no longer afraid for Lassie because we knew how the story ended. And I want to suggest to you that among the many things that Easter means, Easter means that we know how the story ends and therefore we can live as people who know how the story ends. 
in the story in the gospel that we just heard, the story of Mary at the tomb in the gospel of John. She goes to the tomb after Jesus has been crucified and dead and buried. She goes to, pers- to pay her respects. And it says at the very beginning, while it was still dark. Now it was still dark partly because it was before sunrise. But it was dark in other ways. Symbolically, it was dark for Mary. Jesus, the one in whom she had put so much hope, the one who had made her feel more alive than she had ever felt before, was dead. And with him, a large part of her died. And the light went out of her life, and it was still dark. It was still dark because she did not know yet how the story ends. And she went to the disciples, the other disciples, and told them, the tomb is empty. I don't know where they took in the, our Lord. We don't know who has taken his body and what might they might be doing to his body, given what they did to it when he was alive. And the disciples The other disciples still did not know the end of the story. They did not understand the scripture that he, Jesus, must rise from the dead. And they run and they see the empty tomb, but the the men don't know what's going on. and They go back to wherever they were. But Mary stays and she weeps outside the tomb. She weeps because she does not know how the story ends. And it looked like the story was over. But then she hears somebody behind her saying, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And she says, I'm looking for my Lord. Somebody has taken his body and I don't know where it is and I just want to pay it respects. Now that he is dead with all my dreams and hopes, I want to at least pay him respect. And then she hears her name, Mary. And when she hears her name spoken by Jesus, whom she loved and who she knew loved her, suddenly she is aware that it is indeed Jesus, her teacher. And she turns and she says, Rabuni, teacher. And where there was darkness, there is now light. Where there was death, there was now life. And Mary went back to the disciples as the very first preacher of resurrection, went back to the disciples as the apostle to the apostles, and she proclaimed the resurrection of the Lord. And in the resurrection of Jesus, we have a foreshadowing, a foretaste, a prediction, the assurance of how the story ends. The story of our lives, the story of this world does not end in death and decay and despair. This world ends in resurrection. It ends in the kingdom of God, the peaceable kingdom where harmony is restored, where all people receive life. The story ends in reconciliation and forgiveness and mercy and peace. J.R.R. Tolkien, in the book, The Return of the King, the last of the Lord of the Rings books, has a scene that I want to read to you with the names changed a bit, because I think Tolkien is actually recreating this scene with Mary and Jesus. Imagine Mary. Jesus I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? A shadow has departed, said Jesus. And then he laughed, and the sound was like music, or like water in a parched land. And as she listened, the thought came to Mary that she had not heard laughter the pure sound of merriment for days upon days without count. Friends, 
the resurrection of Jesus is the promise that in the end, everything that is sad is going to come untrue because there is a truer truth. Jesus is risen. And with Jesus, our lives, as we heard in the passage from Colossians, our lives are hid in his life and we are dead to death, dead to all that is sad, dead to all that gets in the way of our ultimate joy and peace. That does not mean that we don't still have to live through whatever chapters of the story are ours to live in. And we are living in a particularly challenging chapter right now as this pandemic of COVID-19 sweeps around the world and around our country. As we are living in self-isolation under restrictions we would rather not be living under, we do not know exactly how this particular chapter is going to end. But we can live in this chapter and whatever other chapters we have to play in the story with a kind of freedom and peace and love because we know how the story ends in the very end. And because we know the story ends with resurrection and reconciliation, because we know that in the end, Jesus is the judge, Jesus is the measure, we can dare to look to Jesus and the example of his life, his life of radical self-sacrificial love, his life of radical peacemaking, his life of radical forgiveness, his life of radical mercy and hospitality and generosity, his life of freedom. We can live now. We can live knowing how the story ends. However grim things seem, however hard they get, however sad they get, even knowing how the, end, the story ends doesn't mean we don't sometimes weep at a movie that we've already seen a dozen times. There will be weeping, but we know how the story ends. And because we know how the story ends, and we know that our lives are caught up in the life of Jesus, we are free. Free to live now, in our time, to play our part in the story, as if we know how the story ends. And when our part of the story ends, which is likely to happen before the last chapter, we still know how the story ends and our own deaths are not the end of the story. Which is why at the funerals, at the burial service, when we do funerals, we say that even at the grave, our song is Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. It has been the custom here during this time of, of uh, doing these unusual services for us to have a little bit of conversation afterwards. And if you have any questions or comments you'd like to offer, uh, you can uh, send those in and Father Aaron will share them. Otherwise, the three of us will just chat for a little bit. But we'd love to have you participate in this. So. Well, I've been thinking more about what I said at 8 o'clock, thinking about... Um, our patron Saint Thomas being missing in action hmm. uh, in the first few uh, post-resurrection scenes and I'm thinking about what was he doing? Was, was he making a few bucks or where was he? Um, and, but he comes in later and the disciples say we've seen Jesus and he's not having it because he hasn't seen it. And then when you spoke in this sermon I was hearing the words Mary heard Jesus. Some people need to hear Jesus. Others, like Thomas, need to see Jesus. So we need to have our connection with Jesus to make the resurrection and make the story and power of the resurrection ours. We need to be entering into it in the way that God has created us to. One of the questions that, that came in was, why did Jesus have to ascend to the Father before he could be touched? 
because he does let Thomas touch him. In fact, invites him to be touched. Like, you know, pl place your hand here. Um, but to Mary, he says, do not touch me. And yet my understanding is that Jesus had not yet ascended to the Father. So why the difference, Bishop? Yeah, Father Ralph? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's a very curious uh, passage because you can imagine how kind of desperately Mary wanted to grab a hold of Jesus. And, and I suspect that uh, part of this has to do with the, um, the very different nature of Jesus after the resurrection. He does invite uh, Thomas to touch him. Although if you read that passage carefully, and it'll be the gospel next Sunday, so tune in for next Sunday. And I'm preaching, so. Father Aaron will, will preach. Aaron, Father Aaron will explain why. I will give a full uh, description. Read, but, but, read in advance and get some really hard questions there you go. for next week. <laughs> but, but actually, Thanks. seriously, uh, the, the God, the, if you read that gospel carefully, it doesn't actually say that Thomas did touch him. Right. Ah. Uh, so Jesus kind of makes that point. You know, look, here's, here are the wounds. I'm still, I still bear the wounds. So I think, you know, as you recall in these Gospels, uh, in this one we just heard, Mary looks at, she sees Jesus, she thinks he's the gardener because Jesus himself is dead, so he can't be Jesus. Uh, and in most of the Gospels, when Jesus shows up, uh, they don't recognize him right away because although it's still Jesus risen from the grave and his body is no longer in the grave, his body has been translated into a different kind of heavenly reality and so they don't quite recognize him and I think probably I'm not sure what it would be like to touch such a body mm. it's my best yeah. I, it reminded me again I, I alluded to this at eight o'clock the you mentioned the the character of you didn't name him you, you quoted Gandalf um, who uh, was you know announcing that the sad things are going to become untrue um, and I it makes me think of you know that that believing in something that is is difficult for us to understand, difficult for us to see, and it reminds me of the the scene in the third Indiana Jones film where he's you know to step out into a, this great wide chasm. The difference being that Indiana Jones didn't honestly know that there was going to be something there. In the Jesus story, we we don't just merely have hope. We proclaim to have faith and know that we are stepping into not a great chasm, but a glorious resurrected life and a life moving on in both in this one and in the life to come. Um, and so, so that just it, the, the juxtaposition of, of the stepping out in faith into nothing, but that's not the Christian message, stepping out of faith into what we know right. is there. Is there something, I can't remember this Indiana Jones movie very well. Does his father say something about stepping out in faith? He says, you must believe, boy. Yeah, no, okay. Well, <laughs> very good. But, so there you go. So, but, so Indiana Jones steps out because he trusts his father. Yeah. Right? Ah, nice. So it's not just blind faith. It's, okay, Dad, right. you're saying do it. I'm going to do it. And uh, I think that, you know, I, I mentioned that the eight, at, at the 8 o'clock service, there's a, a character, cannot remember her name. It's, it's in one of the more obscure pieces of uh, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. But she says something along the lines of, we hope based on what we already know. Mm. And mm. I think that's for Christians. We dare to step out in faith. We dare to love when it seems like a foolish thing to do. We dare to forgive when it seems like it's ridiculous. We turn the other cheek. We pray for our enemies. All those things that seem ridiculous because we know that the way of Jesus is the measure of all things and that in the end, uh, we know how the story ends, resurrection. In, in light of this conversation, isn't it fascinating the different ways and places we can see Jesus present? We see, connect to Jesus in a, in a movie lyric or, or words or scenes. We, we see Christ and God is omnipresent, so it makes sense. But if we're looking, we may see. Yeah. Was there another question there you were going to? The, uh, one, one person commenting uh, that They've always wondered if Mary didn't recognize Jesus because she was blinded by her tears. Mm. You know, that, and which begs the question, what are we blinded to? Uh, do we fail to see the presence of God, the omnipresence right. of God 
in things that we would say, oh, no, 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 God could never be there because I'm blinded by my own understanding or my own ignorance or my own who piety. <laughs> on the way to Emmaus, who is it? It's Mary and Clopas? Who's, who are the two on the, the way to Emmaus? Yeah, there are two guys. Cle yeah, there's Cleopas well, and Well, yeah. one yeah. is probably a wife, but it's probably Jesus' aunt and uncle. Ah. And don't recognize him. No. But even when he was in the flesh, people didn't recognize him as the Messiah because they had an idea what the Messiah was supposed to look like. Right? You have so, eyes to see? So if we, yeah. uh, you know, so the, it's a good question. What is it that, what image of Jesus or God do I have in my head that might keep me from actually seeing Jesus God uh, when, when uh, revealed. Is it formulaic or is it beyond that? Like, I, I want it to be formulaic. I want to be able to go A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And I don't think that's how the kingdom of God works. I think it bursts forth in ways right in the midst of this creation here in ways that I don't even understand. Um, probably in our weakness. Right. Yeah. That, that's probably what Paul would say, yes. whether we like it or not. <laughs> Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you all.